last module for the semester is going to be covering over special senses. And we're going to focus on the structures and the anatomy, namely, for the special senses. That includes your eyeball, that includes your ear, that includes your olfaction sense of smell, and then your tongue for taste. All right, so we'll start with the eyeball first. This is a very classic model of the eye. Um, the outer parts of the eye do overlap with muscle, so you can still see the superior rectus on top. You can still see the inferior rectus on the bottom, the lateral rectus, medial rectus. So you can still see the muscles, and, and you'll you want to know those because those are considered accessory structures of the eyeball. All right, so lacrimal bone right here, highlighted in the, the blue area, the maxilla bone. Hopefully you don't forget any of the bones, zygomatic bone. And then in the uh, eyeball that's located in a socket, you might even see a little bit of cushion of fat underneath it, right? A little bit of fat pad that serves as a cushion. And just to reiterate why I'm using this platform to, to share this in Zoom is because number one, this one is, is, is from another source, so you have to pay for it. And I, I don't want you to have to pay for all this stuff. Number two is that it actually highlights the label for you, right? So versus when you look at an image that has an arrow, or a line, it's it's okay, but the arrow sometimes might not be pointing exactly at the structure, or maybe a little bit more ambiguous and might cause confusion. So that's one small thing I think could be done better. But the fact that they highlight it basically makes it even better. All right. So over here, superior rectus on top, inferior rectus is the muscle that helps you uh, depress the eyeball. Superior rectus elevates the eyeball. Medial rectus moves your eyes medially towards your nose, and the lateral rectus more, moves it to the lateral side. We then also have our superior oblique that wraps around at an angle, but the superior oblique's function is to depress uh, laterally, right? And then the inferior oblique elevates laterally on the bottom. So just a kind of a recap of the six muscles, the six intrinsic muscles of the eyeball. Then moving from the muscles, we're gonna look into the actual structures, right? The first thing that you see in somebody's eye is the white part of the eye. The white part of the eye is called the sclera. This is the outer layer. There's a color part of the eye called the iris. This could change. And then the coloration of a human eye is, uh, is, is many. So, so this is interesting because it's many genes that code for this one expression. That's why you might see a blue iris, a brown iris, even a green iris, right? That's because of the variations of genetic expression. And then that little opening that allows you to go into the retina is called the pupil, right? And, and it's controlled by a, ser a series of small fibers that are shown here, these little lines called the ciliary body of ciliary zonules that can allow the pupil to dilate or constrict. And that constriction dilation is under the control of our autonomic nervous system, also known as the ANS, right? You remember there's two divisions. One division is called a sympathetic division, and then there's one called the parasympathetic division, right? And so depending on if you're resting and calm, digesting, your, your eyes are able to then relax if you're trying to run for your life you might have to dilate to see more light okay so that's your that's your uh, tiny little autonomic nervous system running the control of the eye over here we have the same thing again zooming up closer the superior rectus again same exact model right just showing you another view a closer up of the same model inferior rectus medial rectus lateral rectus and then you have superior oblique only a little bit visible here you would want to see it from a top-down view but because it's 2D, right, I can't shift the model for you and then inferior oblique. The eyeball is one of those models that no matter what company makes these or where you go, it's very, very comparable, right? You won't really see big differences. Uh, some of the older models generally might have some detail that might not be the same, but in, in, a, in a relative comparison to different models, different images, and different companies, the eyeball is pretty comparable, right? It's, it's like you just need one good eyeball and then you should know the anatomy. You take the eyeball, you open it up, you remove the outer part of the sclera, and now you expose the inner part, darker membrane called the choroid. This dark region is called the choroid. It's comp composed of the middle layer where you have a lot of nerves, blood vessels, arteries. You have the main retinal artery that goes in over here and the main retinal vein that comes out. And then you also have the optic nerve. So this, this little point on top is called the op this is the exit point where the optic nerve comes out, cranial nerve number two. And that area where all these nerves and blood vessels come into together is called the blind spot. Now that's the area where technically there is no photoreceptors, right? Because that's where everything comes out. And then shortly next to it, which you can't see in this view, there's a region over here called the macula lutea. Right? And, and within that late region, there's like a pinpoint called the fovea, it's called the fovea centralis, fovea 
F-O-V-E-A, Centralis, which actually contains the highest ratio of rods and cones. So it gives you the best color vision. And the way this works is if you ever had, so if you're somebody that has a correction lens, if you have glasses, and if you don't have glasses, and you're trying to look at something far away, there's a natural tendency for us to want to squint our eyes, right? You want to squeeze your eyes because you're trying to distort the lens so that as the light rays come into the eyeball, right? So imagine the light rays, right? The, the light coming into the eyeball from the bottom, it's going to first hit the outer cornea. It's going to then refract and bend through the lens and then hopefully hit some part of the retina. And ideally, you want it to hit on the fovea. That, that's where you have the maximal amount of resolution, okay? And that's hard to see in this picture, but I'll, I'll show you some different views. So iris is that over here, the cornea, the crystal layer outside. That's the part that you touch, right? So if you, have if you have contact lens, this is what sticks onto your cornea to help you refract the light a little better, right? And, and this, is, this is the area that um, if you also go through cataract surgery, or recontour uh, of, of the lens, there's uh, very precise techniques now where they will cut a little bit of this cornea open, flap it out, and then work on the lens and then put it back, right? So it's it's a very, very precise, uh, very delicate surgery, but it's it's definitely been, been well perfected, I would say, to some degree, especially with LASIK. And, um, you know, for example, in Korea, they, there's a, almost like a culture of doing that. Like people just get um, plastic surgery or touch up to their faces uh, as like a, a rite of passage. The front part of the eye is called the anterior chamber. And the part right behind it over here is called posterior chamber. And then one thing I would like to highlight is that the eyes does contain fluid. The fluid inside the eyeballs are two kinds. There's one called the aqueous humor. Aqueous. Aqueous means it's more watery liquid, and that's going to be filled in the front part of the eye. And then on the back part of the eye, we have a structure. Called, we have another kind of fluid called vitreous humor. And the vitreous humor is more of a jelly substance that maintains the intraocular pressure of the eye, maintains the shape, and also helps refract the light. As we get older, as we age, the amount of that fluid begins to decay. And because of the drop in that fluid content, your eyes shrink, and that's why you get near uh, farsightedness. So that's a natural outcome. So when you get older, you're bound to get farsighted because the fluid drains down. Over here, we have the choroid. That's the darker part of the eyeball. Optic nerve, cranial nerve number two, and then the medial rectus again, and the lateral rectus, right? So just showing you the same picture, but giving you a chance to look at different markings, living structures, you know, a few at a time and not just all 20 things at one image that can sometimes overwhelm you, right? So I think that's that's one of the tricks. One of the tips, if, if you're trying to learn anatomy is that there are a lot of labels, a lot of markings, a lot of features on a structure, but instead of looking at all of them at one time, break them down. Do like five at a time, five at a time, five at a time, so that by the time you finish it, you've covered like 25, right? Versus just looking at a picture with 25 labels that's usually not the best way to, to th digest all that content. Sclera, we have the cornea, that clear crystal ball in the middle, that's the vitreous humor. And tear chamber on the bottom right here, the little, little area highlighted, ciliar bodies. These are the fibers I was talking about that actually hold up the lens. Your lens is an avascular structure that sits right here. It's, it's an avascular, like a, almost like a little plastic glass. And this structure can then pull and, and be flattened or be compressed depending on these little fibers squeezing on the lens. The lens can change shape. And most of the time when you have a, an eye vision problem, when you can't see something properly, it's, it's usually a result of A, your eyeballs being too big, or B, your eyeballs being too small, or in, in cases of astigmatism, and that could also be the case where the curvature of the cornea is not even. Right? You have this distorted curvature, and that causes you to not be able to bend the light the right way. The lens is right here, and then the posterior chamber right in the back. All right, so over here, the choroid again, the retina. This is the innermost layer where you have photoreceptors. This is the layer that I showed you in the beginning of our zoom on that, on that JPEG in the canvas page, where there's the layer of photoreceptor cells, the rods and cones, and then the bipolar and ganglion. We have the posterior cavity, that's the back end. Again, the optic nerve, cranial nerve number two, 
And then the two muscles that you can see very clearly, medial, lateral, right? Medial, lateral, okay? All right, so that hopefully gives you a good sense of the eyeball. You take that jelly stuff out, and then you can see same thing again, sclera, the cornea, anterior chamber, ciliary body, the suspensory ligaments. These are the, the fibers that will then uphold the muscles. And then there's also a little border called the aura serrata, which is going to be where this front end, technically kind of like the divide between the anterior and posterior, the front end of the fibers begin to arise. And that marks the front, right? The anterior is over here. And then the posterior is really over here, right? So it's like, it's like an equator. Think of it like a, the, the bisector of the front part of the eyeball versus the back part of the eyeball, the aura serrata. It's like a little thin line. And then over here, we have the choroid again, the retina, and then the optic nerve, optic disc, and then the central artery of the retina. So you can see very clearly how that artery is a main artery. Let me use red for this one might be a little bit easier. But the main artery that comes over here, exits out, right? And then we have the blue vein that comes from here and exits out with the with the optic nerve, right? So this is the main blood vessel that supplies um, supplies to the the body. And and you you we might have also even heard about some other conditions such as the issue of of having this um, retina, uh, macular degeneration where the mac the retina layer could over time either through trauma or through just genetic um, inheritance where the, the retina could also dislodge and that could lead to blindness. When you have a ton of fluid buildup inside the eyeball and it can't drain, you might even hear about the condition called glaucoma, right? That's because you have so much fluid pressure buildup and it's pressing onto the vessels and causing problems. Another important thing that can also be used is the diagnosis of diabetes, right? So when you have diabetes and you have hypertension, even the blood vessels in your eyeball could be expanded and enlarged, right? And if you ever see leakage or blood stain inside this area, that could be indicative of that. That's why when you go to a ophthalmotrist, you, you have an eye checkup where they will dilate your eyes. They take the ophthalmoscope and they look right into your eye, right? It's a flashlight that can look right into the retina and, and the um, doctor will, will basically analyze um, the, the color, the, the shape of the vessels, and how it looks. All right, so I hope that gives you a sense of the main structures internal to the eyeball. Uh, now, taking a posterior view of the eye, you can see the sclera, the white part of the eye. You can see the optic nerve root coming out. We can see a little bit better view of the superior oblique muscle and then the inferior oblique. All right, so just taking that same model and just turning it around to the back to show it to you, right? So I got to show you a couple of views and then you can expect to see these same exact structures on other models, right? So just like I said, try not to just memorize images for the sake of images, know the eye really well so that you know these are the, the 10, 20 labels that you can pick from and then go from there, okay? Superior rectus on top, inferior rectus on the bottom, medial rectus, and then uh, lateral rectus. The first part is when you look at the ear, and these models are very similar no matter where you go. Uh, if you have an older model, a newer model, they always kind of look like this. They have the outer ear, right? The outer ear is going to be the flat. This is called the pinna. The pinna is the this outer ridge-like structure, and then the auricle is the ri this kind of circular part of the, of the ear called the auricle. Um, and then on the bottom, we have the structure called the earlobe, right? The earlobe. This is the earlobe on the bottom. And that, that really is your outer ear, pretty simple. And then we have the middle ear, which is gonna be kind of that middle ear right here. Okay, so to make it easy, to make it to make life easier, I would like to divide the ear this way. Okay, so this is the way that I think it's easier. So outer ear is on the right of that yellow line. The inner ear is going to be the cochlea, the snail structure right here, and then everything in the middle is kind of the, the middle ear, right? So you have the outer, the outer, we have the middle, and then we have the inner. Okay, so I hope that makes it a little bit easier. And then the outer and the middle ear contain air medium, which means that they're exposed to air. The inner ear, the snail structure, is the only one exposed to fluid content, all right? You have this long um, ear canal called external acoustic medius. They call it the EAM or the ear canal for fans for, for simplicity. We have the tympanic membrane, that's the eardrum right here. And then we have the tiny three little bones called the ossicles, which I'll show you in another picture, okay? So you'll see all these structures here. 
And then the most interesting anatomy is going to be the cochlea, right? So that's the one I showed you in the beginning of today's Zoom, what you should focus on, right? The auricle, the temporal bone, the external acoustic meatus, also known as the ear canal, tympanic membrane, the eardrum, and then the auditory tube. This is, uh, this is one that also is referred to as the eustachian tube. So this is one that has two names, but the eustachian tube is more of an old school term that they use to refer to the auditory tube. And this is the opening that connects your ear to your nose. And you probably know this because of the need to yawn to alleviate pressure buildup if you climb a mountain or hike, or also when you have an ear infection or nose infection, it can go back and forth, right? So thank goodness that, thank goodness that the, I, I, again, I don't know, I haven't read of anything of this, but COVID getting to your nose can damage your olfaction, but I don't know if it can damage your hearing, right? That would be pretty scary if the virus could travel up the eustachian tube into the ear. I don't, I don't think that's the case, but that you never know, right? Who knows? Maybe it mutates one day and it becomes a super virus. I don't know. Uh, and over here we have the malleus, the incus, and stapes. These are the ossicles, the three smallest bones of the human body that allow you to vibrate into the inner ear. And then on the cochlea, the bottom section of the cochlea, we have a region called the vestibuli apparatus, the vestibuli. The vestibuli is a structure that contains hair cells for equilibrium, for balance. And this part contains a set of cells also known as the autolithic organ. All right, autolithic organ, which is a layer of hair cells, kind of like the one I, I drew earlier on the hearing part, but they have a layer of crystals on there, a little, little bit of, of salt crystals that help you bend the hair, okay? And then we have the three semicircular canals right on top of it. These are the, the hair cell region that contain the ability to have ex the rotational acceleration, which is basically the um, turning, rolling your head uh, up and down rotational acceleration. And th that region contains another set of cells also known as the crista, crista ampullaris. All right, so it's another set of hair cells, but they're similar, right? The hair cells, these are all hair cells, by the way, very similar. They have this main hair cell and depolarizes depending on how you bend it. But the theme right in, in the ear is that you have these modified hair cells that are nerve cells that can fire signals. And then of course the cochlea, which is for hearing, that snail-like structure, not really the best for you, right? Because you can see it's kind of cut off there. And I'll show you a couple of different images. All right, so there you have the anatomy. So this is another view, top down, anterior, posterior, external ear, middle ear, inner ear. Over here, we have the auricle, temporal bone, tympanic membrane, the malleus, which is like the mallet, right? It's like a mallet, a hammer. The incus, this is the, the anvil. And the stapes is like the chisel or the, or the nail, the smallest one that's connected. So they're all three connected. It helps you vibrate into the inner ear. And if you uh, have heard of uh, deafness, right? There, there are two kinds of, of pathologies that occur. One is called conductional deafness, which means that the patient is not able to get the vibration into the inner ear. So they need some kind of amplifier, like an earpiece. And then the other one is uh, sensorineural. So sensorineural deafness is when the nerve is damaged, right? So they will need some kind of a uh, implant to be able to amplify that signal, right? So there's two kinds of deafness that could occur. Over here, some circular canals, another view, you can see the anterior, the lateral, the posterior. Right? So there's three. I, I know this is not the best view, but there's three. There's one, two, and three. Okay, so there's three of these tubes. And then we have the vestibuli tubule. This is the joint section between the semicircular canals and the cochlea. I right, can see it's right in the middle. And then the cranial nerve number eight, vestibuli cochlear nerve. And you should see this one, right? So this is the same exact model, very similar, right? Right. And then you have the label over here. The label answers on the right. Unfortunately, it's not highlighted for you, just arrows. And then over here, a zooming in closer to that again with the labels, right? So this is good practice. Just, just look at this yourself, practice it, you know, write it out yourself. And then the answer is on the bottom over here. This is, this is the ear tympanic membrane removed out. So if you were to be able to break this piece out and it's funny because this little piece of the model is like no bigger than a, the size of a, of a dime or quarter. And I've seen this been like lost, like a countless amount of times. Okay. People just, just knock it over. They actually put it in their pocket, whatever. But this is one of the structures that every time we do it in personal lab, it gets very, very, um, 
you know, stringent. Everybody's like, oh my God, you know, where's the tympanic membrane? Somebody lost or took it or, or you know, hit it. But it's a small little piece of plastic that has the three bones of malleus, the incus, and the stapes, and the tympanic membrane in the back. All right, so just uh, this is a view that I think is very important to look at. So don't forget this. Right here, you have answers. Um, this one has a tympanic ring, so it's a little bit more detailed. And then you also have the uh, chorda tympani. So there's two, two structures that are a little bit more detailed that you don't see on, on the bigger model. All right. And then just another view of the same thing, the semicircular canals, right? We have the three, three loops. One, two, three. Vestibular apparatus right here and the cochlea right here. All right. So same exact stuff. The structures won't change. It's just a slightly different view or model so that when you're looking at it, it gives you um, a chance to, to really appreciate the structure. All right. So just look, go back and forth. And I hope that helps. All right. So let me stop there for a few seconds. Is there any questions about the ear? For the tongue and smell, I'm going to use another PowerPoint from the video to show you what, what I'm talking about. All right. So I'm, I'm going to go to the Lab 11 General and Special Senses video. I'm going to click on to the third video. So this is old fashioned Augustation right here. So this is the PowerPoint. This is uh, the video, seven, seven minutes or so. But let me show you this, this, this image first before I go over anything else, right? So the first one is when you have the ability to smell, what happens is these chemicals from the flour, from your food, from the cup of coffee, these small little odor molecules will come into your nasal tract and go through the, uh, um, the nasal concha, right? So get funneled in, you breathe in, and now these chemicals begin to get trapped by little tiny hair cells located inside the olfactory epithelium, right? They send, they, they bind the chemicals, they pick up that, that little, little, little compound, and then they begin sending a signal up the chain through the cribiform plate of the ethmoid bone, right? So remember the bone, ethmoid bone. The signals go upwards and they then route through a set of neurons. They end up in a set of neurons called the glomerulus. The glomerulus is this round globular interaction between the nerves that pick up the signal and then the neurons that fire the action potential. The two kind of cells that then fire the signal to the brain is the mitral and tufted cell. So it is a relay of information and there are only so many hundreds of smells that we can detect. And so if you were to map out smell, and, and you might have even heard of this concept that you know, certain animals, certain dogs might have a stronger sense of smell or certain, certain kinds of fishes. And the reason is because of the fact that their olfactory hairs can pick up and trap different odorants. If we don't have the ability to trap that odorant, then you never have the ability to process a sense of smell. So that's why there are chemicals out there that are odorless, which can be very toxic to the human body, but because they can't bind to a hair cell, you can't smell it, right? So that's number one. The sense of taste is also very similar, right? These are all chemical based. So the sense of taste, is like so. So you, you look at your tongue. You probably had a chance to brush your tongue or, or to, to eat something. And, and you look at the tongue, you'll notice that there are these very weird lumps called the papillae. The papillae are spread throughout different parts of your tongue. In the middle part of the tongue, we have most of the, the fillet form. Uh, in the front end, we have the fungi form. And on the lateral sides, we have the foliate form. All right? So we have three kinds of these papillae that you find on your tongue. Each of the papillae, right, so I'll just write this down, the papilla or papillae, uh, papilla, contain, this is, this is the larger lumps on the tongue. They contain taste buds, all right, along them. And then within a taste bud, you have taste cells. So the taste cells are five different types. We have the sour, we have the sweet, we have the bitter, we have umami, and then we have salty. All right, so five kinds of taste cells. And these taste cells are then located along the taste buds. So that's how when a chemical that comes into your tongue, they eat from the food products that triggers a, a certain kind of taste is because that chemical goes through that taste cell. Okay. And the model for this one, I'm, I'm going to close this image, go to the canvas page, go to the module, and I'm going to show you that last two images on the very bottom of our canvas page. So the tongue and the retina. This tongue is a, is a kind of older image from the lab, but it, it is it's still pretty good. The labels are on top right here. So the papillae, the fungi form, the filiform, the feliate. Uh, and then over here, we have the model. So this is one that comes from the model itself. And then you can see the labeling on the right-hand side, taste buds. And then you can see the taste cell 
right here. Okay, so this is a taste cell. And the reason why you can see the different coloration, like this one's a little bit purple, this one's a little bit blue, this one's a little bit more tan, is because there's different kinds of taste cells. Right? This could be for sour. This could be for, for bitter. Right? So different arrangement of taste cells. And then on the right-hand side, you have the tongue. So for this image right here, unfortunately, you're just going to have to go up to the, the answer key, look at it, come down, label it, and as you go. Okay? So that is for the tongue. Um, the other one that I have is for the retina. This will also be pretty helpful to look at. So again, at the very, very bottom of the image bank, you have the tongue. We have the retina. And right here, this is an older image of the retina of the eyeball. Right, so this is a close-up image of a, of a model. This is an older model of the photoreceptor layer. You can see how the cells are different. This is, these are the rosin cones, right? The rosin cones are right here. The rosin cones, right? And I would say defer to the label for the exact answer key. We have the bipolar cell in orange. That layer of cell in orange is the bipolar. And then the outer layer in yellow is the ganglion. Okay, so those are your five major kinds of cells found inside your, your uh, retina. But you might also have the uh, amacrine and horizontal cells in there that might not be shown. And then on the right-hand side, it's just zooming in to the rosin cones. Okay, so you can see the, the, the nucleus of the cell, the rod fiber, you have the dendrite where it sends out. Uh, but for this image, same thing, just look at the labeling and then uh, compare it to the answer key. Okay, the labeling right here. So the labels are all right here and then you, have, you can just match it with the numbers.